Hello, my name is Brother George Van Grieken. I'm speaking to you from my office in Napa, California. This used to be the uh, music room for the novitiate, and now I'm able to use it as my office. Um, welcome to this presentation about innovation and in the Lasallian world. I'm sorry it's not a Zoom-like interface where I can see everybody, but I hope that this input will be helpful as you are challenged by the need for innovation on so many uh, levels especially, obviously, Huther Conference itself is a great innovation. Now, let's start because there's a lot of material to cover. I'll be looking at three main areas this afternoon. De La Salle himself in innovation, innovation through the years of La Salle history, and innovation today. We will start with De La Salle's innovative disposition and actions. In the 19th century, Ralph Waldo Emerson made a statement that I think applies well to John Baptist de La Salle and the educational movement that bears his name. The statement is this, the creation of a thousand forests is in one acorn. If we think of de La Salle as that one acorn, the wide extent of La Salian Catholic educational institutions throughout the world are the forests. The trees in those forests are the different places and ministries and teachers and leaders. There are the branches. Finally, of course, the leaves are all those who benefit from life that comes from the twigs and branches, from the tree and its roots, and from the wider forest itself. I don't want to run the analogy to the ground, but I want to establish at the outset that when we talk about Lasallian history, we are talking about a living history, an ongoing history, a history that draws on centuries of lived experience, of thoughtful practice, of people and places not our own. In the best sense of the word, we come out of and are carried by our tradition, which according to J.K. Chesterton means giving votes to the most obscure of all classes, our ancestors. It is the democracy of the dead. But they are what give us life. Ours is an ongoing journey of the educational life that began in 1680 in a small city in northeast France. And a small group of marginally, very marginally, competent teachers whose relatively unwilling leader was finishing his doctorate in theology and part of a social class that kept itself well insulated from direct dealings with the poor although indirectly helping the poor, it was considered a virtue. When it comes to innovation, this first group of teachers saw De La Salle living a different kind of life, engaged with the circumstances and people around him. To him, invitations and events were calls from God. Each circumstance provided a providential encounter with God's presence in his life, something to be listened to, prayed about, and responded to. This is such a foundational aspect of De La Salle's life, life journey and a major catalyst for his innovative responses that I would like to share a short video that makes the point directly. I suppose um, the way it would uh, come through in some cultures would be, would be this. Um, in the United States, you, you're called Christian brothers. In many other parts of the world, we call ourselves De La Salle brothers because there were Christian brothers uh, from Ireland who took our rule and certain ideas and they were in those countries before we came. But we're not unhappy about that. We're very happy to call ourselves brothers of De La Salle because uh, I think of him as somebody who was a very, very great man. I think he was a great man because he allowed himself to be led uh, by events well beyond everything which his, his breeding, his education, uh, if you like, had led him to. That where uh, the scholar, the theologian, uh, would have led, all those things would have led him to become a bishop. And yet he allowed himself to become involved with somebody who was interested in schools for poor boys. And somewhere in that meeting with, with the poor, he found himself challenged. He found himself challenged in a very profound way, probably about his own life, his own wealth, 
his own level of society and a certain sense that somebody ought to do something about this. And I have no doubt at all in my own reading uh, of his life that his initial contact with uh, Adrian Neal and with the first brothers and the first schools was something which he saw as incidental. And I happen to believe also that even right up to 1694 he had seen his task as actually getting this movement off the ground. He'd been called in some way to help people and that's what he was going to do. But in 1694 he took that plunge of actually making vows for life with this group of people. He cut off all other possibilities at that moment. And that's when I often think that's when he became a founder. It's not accidental that we have in, well we don't have the copy any longer, but we did have up, up to the revolution, uh, a wonderful document called The Memoir of the Beginnings. And this was a manuscript found when he was in the south of France talking about the first years of the society. And most of the things we quote from de La Salle are from that. For example, if God had shown me the work that I was to do, the involvement with the Christian schools, etc., I wouldn't have dared to begin the work. God who does all things with wisdom and doesn't really push people, he says, led me imperceptibly so that one decision led to another until I found myself doing something that I had never anticipated. Now that's a man writing in 1694, 95, sometime after the work had got started. And I think that openness of this man to read events as calls from God uh, is probably one of the most striking things about him. And that in some way, if he'd just done this himself, it would have been one thing, but in some way he was able to inspire a small group of people to follow him. And yet even at the end of his life, when he died in 1719, he'd been almost 40 years tied up with these schools, and he had exactly 100 followers. And if you take another great saint, like Francis of Assisi, who in 22 years gathered 10,000 disciples, de La Salle must have wondered as he lay dying what was going to happen to these 100 people. 23 communities, 100 people. One brother stuck down in Rome, Gabriel Drolin. And yet that was to become the great movement of the 18th century first, 19th century, and then of all those congregations founded in the spirit of his rule, sometimes with the very letter of his rule. The Myrus brother, for example, we're told, little brother of Mary, is called to do in the small towns and cities what the brother of the Christian schools does in the large towns and cities. The Irish Christian brothers, founded with exactly the same second chapter of a rule, who take many of the customs, and the first generation of which regard themselves as the Christian brothers, the brothers of the Christian schools in Ireland. So I think the man is inspirational, not just for his generation, but for many afterwards because of what he wrote and because of the wisdom of what he wrote in the conduct, the rule, and his meditations has served thousands, I suppose, of other people, has given them inspiration and has made them realize that there are various ministries in the church and that one of the most important ministries will always be the person who's prepared to work with young people in the ministry of teaching. And that's why I think of John Baptist de La Salle. I'd have to say that as a young brother, when I read his life first, I found him rather remote, rather stern, uh, very disciplined in a way that I wasn't. But in the years that I've been privileged to actually study him and read him in his own native language uh, and come to understand him better through the work of great scholars, uh, I now have for him a very deep love and affection. And uh, each time I go into St. Peter's in Rome and I walk down the main aisle, I like to look up halfway down and there he is presiding over the whole nave.
De La Salle was the acorn and the forest grew because of his priorities, his approaches and his responses. In a word, because of his spirituality. Let's now take a, just a few key moments from the beginnings of this educational movement to see how that genuine respect for and engagement with the events of his life, events that he saw as calls from God, provided the invitation and substance of his innovative disposition. It was a providential encounter with a layman from Rouen at the door of, the, of a sister's convent that started the ball rolling. Adrian El had been sent to Reims to start a school for poor boys. And he told De La Salle about it, explaining his purpose and plans. De La Salle cautioned him about some of the political realities in Reims, but also said, in effect, let's see how I can help you. Here is, I submit, the first clear decision that displays his innovative disposition. He could have let the ball pass. He could have wished Niel good luck and a, and a prayer. He could have given him some advice then and there and left it at that. He could have gone on with his life as it was, but he didn't. He invited a carefully chosen group of religious leaders that could help determine how best to help Adrian Niel get a small school for poor boys started. From that very first meeting at De La Salle's house in Reims, thoughtful innovation became part of the DNA of what would become the La Salle charism. It was this group's discussion that led to a shared decision that they could do something about this together. Like many such charity schools at the time, the funding for this school for poor boys was provided by what today we would call a large endowment, which paid a minimal salary for the teachers. One of the consulting group's own members, the pastor of a nearby parish, wanted a school for the poor. He was also best placed to face the likely opposition of city officials of different interest groups and of the fee-paying schools that were already there. Since the Council of Trent had allowed pastors to set up parish schools independently of any outside authority, civic or otherwise, this pastor could stand up for his rights. And the school at the parish of saint Maurice started soon thereafter in April of 1679. By the end of that year, there were three such schools in Reims filled with six teachers that were recruited by Adrian Niel and financed, financed by endowments established by dying widows or donated funds. Between four and 500 students were now being taught in these schools. Since De La Salle had assured a widow whose funds supported one of the schools that he would make sure the teachers did a good job, he felt compelled to do what he could to fulfill that promise. As a result, he now had to take a, a set of steps that he had never anticipated. Over a period of a year, <clears throat> he visited the classrooms, rented a house for the teachers to live in, had meals brought to them from his own house, invited them over for an Easter retreat, and finally had them come to his family home daily so that they could have their meals with him and so that he could help with their teaching, with their classes and school organization, and also with their table manners. De La Salle in, involved, uh, greatest in, De La Salle's involvement was a great help to the layman in charge, Adrian Niel, who was actually better at starting schools than at running them, and it was often a way to start schools elsewhere. But more importantly, this arrangement gave the teachers confidence and personal encouragement, allowing them to ask their questions and discuss their teaching methods on a regular basis. De La Salle inspired their motivation, urging them to lean on God's help and provided them with a way to pursue a genuine teaching vocation. Some stayed, some left, some joined, but De La Salle persisted. God had continued to leave these teachers under his guidance and he would not abandon them. They would have to abandon him because then God's will would have been clear to De La Salle. Consider that if all the teachers had left and if the schools had closed, it's doubtful that De La Salle would have continued in this work. He was an ordained priest, very well educated, a canon of the cathedral with rich benefits and extensive responsibilities, and very well placed socially among a host of wealthy, well-connected family members and acquaintances. He would have plenty to do, and he would do it well if this little venture didn't pan out. But De La Salle was known to be somewhat stubborn. 
and he was deeply attentive to his spiritual life, his daily encounters with God in prayer, with others, and with the world around him. This is dangerous. Creativity is coming up with new ways of doing things, but innovation is actually doing them. He was just the kind of person who would do something instead of just thinking and dreaming about it. And so a year after he invited the teachers to join him daily for meals and advice, he traveled to Paris to consult with Father Nicolas Barbet, a well-respected holy priest involved with education for the poor and well-connected with others involved in the same kind of ministry. Barre's advice was uncompromising. When following the gospel, innovation's call can be very stark. Barre said, bring them into your house to live with you. He also urged De La Salle to trust completely <clears throat> on God's providence in everything he did. It took another six months, but when the lease to the school that the teachers were living in expired, he brought the teachers into his family home. On June 24th, 1681, the teachers moved into the house and De La Salle's family protested and tried to stop him, but to no avail. Some of his family went elsewhere. One of his younger brothers remained in the house and his brother-in-law sued him for the house, which indeed was sold a year later. At that time, the, the eight or so teachers in De La Salle moved to a poorer part of town where they could develop their own identity and their own ministry. Four brothers were in two schools located outside of Reims, so the whole group of about 12 was still rather small. But they were now entirely on their own, and the determination, intelligence, expertise, and commitment that De La Salle brought to the enterprise fueled the innovations that, would bring, that he would bring about and that they would bring about. This is a good point uh, to po point out uh, De La Salle's, to put his uh, innovative character into some kind of a context. The nature of his innovative disposition arose from his religious character and was applied to a specific social context. He was driven by an ongoing passion for saintly personal activities, yet he knew that they were part of an established social and clerical system. They would organize themselves in such a way that their internal lives and their public lives were integrated and focused on the good they were meant to do for the students entrusted to their, to their care. Today, we call this the spirit of faith and zeal. It was a major innovation already to have such a group at all, especially at that time in France. The priority was not to fit in with the established systems. Even their unique role was strange to others but rather to do what was needed to ensure that the schools ran well and that those teaching in them were able to do so through their shared personal and community lives. De La Salle never sought official approval for the group during his lifetime, although he knew how to do so. For him, this group of teachers, these brothers, would represent something new in the church, a committed group of educators who were not clerical and were not laypersons. Rather, they would live as a religious community with a primary purpose of following the gospel together through the ministry of teaching together. And De La Salle's leadership style was itself innovative. One book puts it this way. De La Salle was content to lead the, lead the teachers by the hand, so to speak, to let them see from their own experience and from his exhortations and example what was the best course to follow. We may see this as appropriate and fairly common these days, but in the 17th century and in France, it was certainly the exception. This leadership style was also the reason why he was so well loved and respected by the brothers. This kind of approach perfectly engaged a group of interested and committed educators ready to make a difference for the students that they worked with every day. Now that we've looked at some of the foundational aspects of the Lasallian historical narrative, especially those that reveal a theme of creativity and innovation from the very beginnings of the Institute, other examples of innovation during de La Salle's lifetime can, all, can only be mentioned briefly and in summary. The generally accepted teaching methodology of the time, with few exceptions, was memorization and one-to-one -one recitation in front of a single teacher. In 1654, when De La Salle was only three years old, 
Jacques de Battencourt was anonymously writing a book called The Parish School, providing instructions on how to use simultaneous teaching methods in a parish. Some private girls' schools, some Port Royal schools, and schools in other countries began to use simultaneous education for teaching large groups of students at the same time. When De La Salle and the brothers began to teach, they took as the, that model as their own. They improved, refined, and detailed its components to align and approve, improve according to their own pedagogical priorities. Review and adapt, review and adapt. Over the decades, they standardized and systematized its application throughout France, eventually creating The Conduct of Christian Schools, a book that was a popular successor to the parish school. A brother could now move, be moved from Calais in the north to Marseille in the south and substitute for another teacher without missing a beat in the lessons. The conduct, as the book is called, became a regularly updated standard guide for simultaneous instruction throughout the country and eventually in other parts of the world. Gratuity for all. De La Salle writes that in the Christian schools, teaching is offered free of charge and entirely for the glory of God. Your teaching must be gratuitous. This is essential for your institute. The brothers were absolutely forbidden to receive any gifts, favors, or keepsakes from the students or their parents, or their parents, especially tobacco, apparently. This, is, this not only guaranteed an equal relationship with all the students, it also maintained De La Salle's conviction that gratuitous instruction was the sole means of effectively and convincingly accomplishing the ends of Christian education. It's like the simplicity of life for St. Francis, uncompromising, convincing, and costly. Like the gospel itself, this education would be gratuitous. The principle was, was also applied to children who attended his schools but could have paid something. In fact, De La Salle got into trouble with others not because he was teaching the poor, but because he didn't stick to it, insisting on offering a free education to everyone who showed up at the door. This was an in innovation that had real consequences for him and the brothers, but they were willing to pay, to pay the price. <laughs> the traditional way of teaching someone to read in school was to start with Latin words and phrases. De La Salle and the brothers did the opposite. In fact, he wrote a defense for teaching reading by way of the language the students use daily. In a letter to a bishop who asked him to have his brothers teach students Latin before teaching them French, he explained the reasons for not doing so. He said that teaching French was much more practical than teaching Latin. French was easier to learn, takes less time, is more useful, and could be a vehicle for learning Latin later. And it is a necessary tool for learning other things like the catechism. Besides, Latin is of little use to working people. There's not enough time to master it in the few years that students spend in the brother schools. And those who come to know only a little bit of it, and that poorly, would look foolish trying to use it. It was one thing to establish good Christian education by providing a well-trained group of teachers, but a school also needs a variety of books. And if something was needed, De La Salle would provide it, writing it himself if necessary. Hence, this doctor of theology wrote everything from exercises of, exercise of piety for the use of Christian schools, instructions and prayers for Holy Mass, teaching French syllables, how to go to confession, prayers for confession and communion, the rules of Christian politeness and civility, spiritual canticles, those are songs and hymns for the use of Christian schools, the duties of a Christian or the catechism of the brothers of Christian schools, and in collaboration with the brothers, he wrote The Conduct of the Christian School over a 40 year period. For most of these books, he studied and referenced other similar works, borrowing and adapting those elements he found to be most helpful. It should also be noted that the brothers themselves also began to write textbooks and reference books for schools, an enterprise that would become ubiquitous over the next two centuries. In places like Calais, Avignon, Marseille, and Grenoble, schools taught subjects based on local needs 
and the likely employment prospects that students would face. In Calais, for example, where, stu where students were sons of sailors, subjects related to sailing, hydrography, geometry, navigation, and business affairs were part of the curriculum. In towns that were involved in commercial trade or manufacturing, it might be bookkeeping or design. The intention was to provide the kind of practical education that students and parents wanted or needed, along with the basic skills of reading, writing, mathematics, and combining all that with Christian formation, social formation, and politeness and civility, and catechetical training. The best way to accomplish that was to be sensitive to the real needs of the students and their potential future. The two to three years that they would spend in school, if that, would need to prepare them for the rest of their lives. LaSallean education was a terminal formal education. Very soon after he had begun to work closely with a small group of teachers in Reims, training them in their ministry, De La Salle responded to the great need for teachers in the outlying villages by offering to train country schoolmasters along with the brothers. In 1687, he began to take in young men from the villages around the Diocese of Reims, chosen and sent by their parish priests for being trained as teachers. He housed the first group of 25 in a building adjacent to the one occupied by the brothers. De La Salle oversaw their formation as Christian educators, and these teachers in training shared many common activities with the brothers. After a few of these groups from the outlying parishes had been trained, no further teachers were needed for the country schools, and the program came to an end. But twice more during his 40 years with the brothers, De La Salle would establish centers where teachers who were not brothers could be trained and prepared for the Ministry of Education. He is credited with having started one of the very first teacher training programs in France. While most of the Christian schools were primary schools, De La Salle was open to answering whatever education needs were presented to him. When he learned that young day workers in Paris needed training and instruction, the brothers established a Sunday school for working men under the age of 20 who wished either to continue their education beyond the elementary level or to learn to read and write if they'd never attended school. Two of De La Salle's most, most talented brothers taught reading, writing, mathematics, draftsmanship, catechism, and art on Sunday afternoons. It was called a Christian Sunday Academy. Another instance occurred after King James II had fled Ireland in 1688. De La Salle was asked to teach the sons of those nobles who had fled with the king. As one writer noted, he boarded them all and filled his house. He himself took particular care of their education with count, without counting entirely on the vigil, vigilance of the brother he put in charge of them, so that in a short time they were able to fill with honor the various places for which they were destined. The intent was to educate these 50 Irish boys and prepare them for future careers in France, either as part of the gentry or in the business or in the business community. But in effect, the brothers took on the education of refugees. The place where some of the most significant innovations occurred was at the brothers' 17 and a half acre property on the outskirts of Rouen, a place called Saint Jean. Leased in 1705 and finally purchased 13 years later in 1718, it became the heart of the religious and educational enterprise of the brothers. It included a manor house, spacious gardens, and a quiet environment. Here, the novices were trained, the annual retreat was held, the brothers came to retire, and three new ministries were begun and subsequently flourished. There was a boarding school for older boys who were destined for careers in commerce and industry. It came about because of requests from parents whose sons were not going on to university, but needed more education than the primary schools had provided. The brothers did run a number of, of gratuitous primary schools in Rouen. <clears throat> the parents wanted classes that focused on trade and industry prospects. The brothers provided classes in history, geography, literature and rhetoric, accounting, geometry, architecture, natural history, mechanics, cosmography, differential calculus, music, and modern languages. 
In effect, the program provided the first secondary school curriculum of its kind, both practical and scholastic. It also turned out to be very successful. And there was a separate facility at St. John for delinquent or what were called incorrigible children, where young men were strictly supervised outside of common classes with the other students. This had also been established through a request from parents who knew that their sons had character difficulties and needed a special kind of education. And so these incorrigible students joined with the others for studies, prayers, and catechism lessons. And if their behavior improved, they might join the other students by moving over to the boarding school side of the property. The great success with the second group led town town authorities to ask the brothers to now also have a detention center for young men and even grown-ups who had caused some scandal or had been confined by the courts. And so special arrangements were made for that third group, locked in their rooms and allowed to communicate only when their attitude changed or their mental health allowed it. Gradually, they may be allowed to come together at meals or do manual work or follow some of the studies provided to the other groups. The successes that De La Salle and the brothers achieved outweighed the difficulties that these new ventures presented. And the income that St. Jan generated from parents and town officials served to support the work elsewhere. De La Salle was especially attentive, attentive to this last group of detainees visiting and speaking with them as he led them to reform their lives for the better. And apparently he was very successful at it. In all this, the Brothers and De La Salle himself created the programs that were needed to address the needs that were placed before them. Innovation was not only an opportunity, it was a manifestation of their ministry and vocation. Other examples of innovation could be mentioned about the Brothers' vows and community life, or De La Salle's strategies of unifying and inspiring them. But this short overview will be enough to make the point that innovation is a constitutive dimension of the LaSallean educational endeavor. Please keep these foundational elements in mind because what follows was carried by the currents that emerged from the years when De La Salle directly shaped the nature of the Institute and the scope of its educational endeavors. So let's now take a look at how this innovative spirit continued on through the centuries. In the 18th century, two areas of innovation stand out, how the brothers organized themselves and the kinds of educational works that they took on. When the schools in the south of France grew in number and size, a novitiate or training center for new brothers was established in Avignon. If local candidates to the brothers had to first travel up to Paris or Rouen for training and then return to teach, in a, to teach around Avignon, their preparation would lack the local cultural and linguistic character that made the area unique, especially at that time in French history, when there were all kinds of patois around the country. Both for the benefit of the students and for the proper training of the teachers, it made sense to locate a training center where those brothers were most likely to serve. Another example is how they worked within the church culture of the time. When local clergy or bishops tried to pressure them to change their structure or priorities, after all, they were only brothers, the brothers were quietly active in the background, seeking good advice, insisting on their their unique position and independent character, and making decisions that would circumvent the problem without appearing appearing to be defiant. One superior general, for example, simply moved the central offices to another diocese. And later, another one established three provinces provinces in France so that the Archbishop of Rouen could not claim authority over the brothers because their central government resided at St. John. In their educational work, along with their schools, brothers were asked to work in what were called general hospitals, places for the destitute, the chronically ill, the elderly poor, orphans, and the insane. For many years, small groups of brothers worked in these places, teaching the boys and serving the others in the residence. It was grueling, difficult, and demanding work. And it was a much, much different environment than the well-ordered, familiar, and uniform circumstances of the solidly established Christian schools. 
which may be the reason why this ministry that did not become generally prevalent in the Institute. However, the fact that it was done at all, and apparently done well, attests to the willingness of the brothers to respond to educational needs for the poor wherever and however they arose. What became much more prominent were boarding schools that the brothers ran along with the gratuitous primary schools for the poor. Such, oops, sorry, that was the wrong one. Such, uh, such boarding schools were income producing and were like the one first developed at St. John. Classes addressed local needs and the fees supported the other schools. In fact, this became a problem for the brothers in charge who tried to limit the number of such boarding schools since it appeared to go against the strict dependence on providence and the gratuity of service. But brothers on the ground knew that these boarding schools helped them to remain gratuitous for the poor, while also providing an education for older youngsters who needed a different kind of education than that which society allowed for at the time. At the end of the 18th century, during the French Revolution, the major innovation of the brothers was trying to find a way to not, whoops, to not get killed. Uh, uh, it's just, Sorry, this was, I uh, don't know what happened there. Okay. So this is one of those things which, uh, which you don't anticipate, but it happens anyway. Nope, sorry. Uh, I'm gonna have to uh, pull out of this and go to the place where I am. Ah, okay. Uh-huh. Take your time, Brother George. Sure, sure. We'll we'll pick it up here. All right. Now this should go. Uh, okay. So this was this is the uh, French Revolution. That's a good place to have a revolution in my PowerPoint. Uh, during the French Revolution, the major innovation was they're trying not to find not to wake the not to get killed. Huh? All the properties, schools, communities, even furniture were taken over by the government, and the brothers were thrown out. They had to take an official oath of loyalty, the refusal of which led many to be imprisoned and some killed. Being a religious was enough to be arrested, tried, and executed. Brothers were often grouped with priests and bishops when anti-religious laws became the norm. In fact, it's remarkable how many documents exist where brothers wrote or publicly defended their unique role as laymen with simple vows who had dedicated their lives to educating the poor without financial compensation. But often it wasn't enough to dissuade those in charge, who as likely as not believed that the brothers were trying to talk themselves out of an identity that appeared obvious to their captors. There were many and diverse ways that former brothers, whether actually former or not, and secularized brothers, whether internally secularized or not, continue to be employed in state and private schools, together or separately. Individual stories attest to the wide spectrum of possibilities that occurred. The innate, innovative skill by which most brothers negotiated these social circumstances showed the years of experience in schools made up of very clever youngsters that they had to control. I recently discovered that in one place, five of the brothers officially secularized, but remained in the same house, even when four of them got married until the end of the revolution. That must have been a very interesting community life. The 19th century was a time of rebuilding. At the end of the French Revolution, of the 750 or so brothers who had been very active in the schools, about 250 of them could be accounted for. 160 of these were still involved in teaching of some kind. But it was the 28 brothers who had stayed together in Lyon that became the core group for the reestablishment of the Institute in France. And it was here that the few brothers who had escaped to our schools in Italy returned. 110 former brothers in France also returned. The government now wanted the brothers to oversee all of primary education in France, and they would be compensated for it. In effect, the schools would now be government sponsored. The brothers agreed to do so only if they could provide a fully gratuitous education at their primary schools. Most authorities agreed, 
but some tried to have parents pay for their son's education to the town councils who would then pay the brothers. This was vigorously opposed by the brothers and many discussions, protests, and compromises were devised. But the point is that the major innovation was a willingness to become like the charter schools of today, but only if they could maintain their essential commitment to gratuitous education. During the 19th century, the number of schools and communities in France fluctuated because of the seesaw of the century's politics. Overall, the number of brothers and schools increased dramatically, growing almost tenfold between 1830 in 1875, when over 12,000 brothers lived in some 1,200 communities and ran twice as many schools all over France. The work of the brothers also diversified. Brothers began to provide lessons on the art of teaching. A training college, like the one shown here, for teachers was established in Rouen, although not on the property of saint John, which was never returned to the brothers after the French Revolution. The Sunday Academy for older students was revived for various towns and groups, and the brothers began to teach children in houses of correction. Boarding schools were also brought back and many more were established. These were private schools and therefore not subject to full government control. But permission was sought from the Holy See since such income producing schools were not strictly permitted under the official Bull of Approbation of 1725. The newly established schools concentrated on teaching students in the areas of local commerce and business. Schools for adults and apprentices were established. Evening schools, midday schools, and Sunday schools addressed unique training and formation needs, accommodated to the students' working time schedules, and special boarding schools for apprentices allowed young people to work, learn, and have a place to live. The classic guide, Conduct of Schools, was revised and re-edited in Lyon and published in 1828, over a hundred years after it was first published. New religious congregations were founded when even the increase of the brothers in their schools could not fulfill the demand in the country. And many of these new groups looked to the brothers and their long educational history and experience to establish themselves in their works. They also carried this, this classic school guidebook to missionary countries outside of France. The other major ministry that emerged was prison ministry. From 1840 on, after authorities were impressed with the work of two brothers in Paris who taught children condemned to prison, groups of brothers increasingly taught and catechized in prisons. Eventually, over a hundred brothers worked with 7,000 prisoners in prisons throughout France, including one in Reims and others in Belgium and Italy. They even had their own brother visitor assigned to them. With the increased number of brothers and expansion into other parts of the world began in 1837 with the arrival of the brothers in Canada. This was followed by a definitive reintroduction of the brothers in the US in 1848. The first attempt in 1817 had failed and two brothers sent from Canada a few years earlier had died. Appeals for brothers for Malaysia and Singapore led to a group of American and European brothers arriving there in November of 1852. Uniquely, they ran their schools with many non-brothers employed as teachers. And during the next few decades, groups of brothers started schools in North Africa, Egypt, England, India, Burma, Ecuador, Vietnam, Madagascar, and Sri Lanka. In some places, such as England and India, there were long periods of failure before becoming established, largely due to language, cultural adaptation, or leadership challenges. Brothers may have demonstrated a great willingness to innovate and improvise, but failure is a clear and severe teacher as well. Eventually, successful schools were established in all these countries. So at the end of the 19th century, we, we see an increasing secularization of society and public institutions, especially among the schools in France. Most of the population might have been Catholic, but they were not able to stop the secularization programs enacted by those leading the French Republic. And the brothers, as the largest teaching congregation in France, 
bore the brunt of their efforts to secularize all of society. A series of laws starting in the 1880s led, the led to the brothers' exclusion from teaching in publicly supported schools, and it culminated in the suppression of the Institute in France in 1904. But this also made many brothers available for overseas assignments, where more attention would now be paid to local conditions and needs, along with a general desire for less uniformity in the Institute as a whole. Structural innovation was emerging. Just a couple of more specifics about the state of innovative education as the brothers moved into the 20th century. A much wider financial support spectrum emerged for various ministries. Some were supported by a public authority and others were strictly private schools. The preference and the intent was to lean more towards gratuitous non-fee paying schools, maintaining as far as possible the principle of gratuity. But both necessity and practical needs allowed for the development of educational models that brought income. In the 1920s, for example, roughly half of all the schools were non-fee paying schools. The others were private schools that looked to school fees for their financial sustainability. As countries made primary education obligatory, the movement into secondary schools became attractive and brother schools started to include both levels on the same premises. Eventually, secondary schools became preferred for financial self-sufficiency reasons, and they could support a non-fee paying school elsewhere. Secondary education also became the new terminal education for young people, the last edu formal education that they would have. Vocational training schools helped students and adults improve their professional qualifications. Evening schools for apprentices were less needed or popular having been associated with primary school students. The training of craftsmen, artisans, and artists became particularly successful among the large and extensive St. Luke Schools network in Belgium, which continued to this day. Science, modern languages, literature, hands-on technical training, and agriculture and the like became part of secondary schools, especially in those schools located outside of France. Military academies brought in intense physical training and discipline, and youth adjudication centers continued to be part of the Brothers Ministries in the United States and elsewhere. From the middle of the 19th century up to today, there was also an increasing interest and involvement in higher education. This was particularly acute in the United States, where for some 70 years, the Brothers advanced the teaching of Latin, officially forbidden by the Brothers' rule but they did so through special permission. Lack of clarity and documentation, however, caused untold miseries for brothers and others when the French superiors pushed back hard, remove, removing American visitors and college presidents and sending them into exile. This so-called Latin question was not resolved until 1923 with a direct intervention of the Pope but its ripples are felt to this day when there are over 60 LaSalle universities around the world. Brothers contributed to the field of education through running teacher training colleges, writing school textbooks, starting printing presses, presses and initiating pedagogical review journals. One LaSalle scholar has researched and documented over 24,000 titles that were written by brothers worldwide from our foundation to the present day. The vast majority of those books were on education related topics. Increasingly, since the end of the 19th century, lay teachers became more prominent in the science schools. While originally brought in due to necessity, especially after Vatican II, that necessity was seen as an advantage. Today, less than 3% of those in the science schools are brothers and the vast majority are men and women LaSallean educators. This has, benefit, has benefited both the brothers and their educational partners. The great innovation lies in how the Institute was and remains on the forward edge of this vocational partnership. Largely, I believe, because the brothers have been and are dispositionally closer to the laity than to the hierarchy or clerical world. Plus. Today, as ever before, 
the Institute exists to advance its ministry, not the number of brothers. That's a lot of information, but it gives a snapshot of the main thrust of the developments that happened during the 20th century and that are happening to this day. We follow a line of innovative, practical, need-based, gospel-inspired, and people-driven educational services, especially for those who are in need and primarily young people. The growth of this institute reaches ever wider and deeper with its educational roots and branches. That small acorn has spawned many trees and forests, and each continues to grow and expand with the same DNA. Now for some examples for, from recent years. First and most significantly are the primary, secondary, tertiary, and special schools and education programs that are currently in place around the world, the things we've been doing for so long. This map shows the ever-expanding numbers. It is to be noted that today, more students are being taught in more places by more Lasallian educators and fewer active brothers than ever before in the history of the Institute. And if this isn't a providential indicator, I don't know what is. But along with these schools, there are many examples of innovative educational projects that complement the core focus of our educational work, complement it. In fact, these innovative educational pro projects are possible because of the foundational reach of our established educational institutions. A 2003 Institute publication says it well. The Institute offers to those who work in it an overall framework which defines the main characteristics of its educational work and its particular thrust. By its permanence in time and its recognized efficacy, this framework functions as a model which provides assurance and makes innovation possible. A strong tree can confidently send its roots and branches in many directions. One fine example of these, brand, uh, of these branches is when the Institute received the Noma Prize for Literacy. In September of 1990, the UN declared International Literacy Year, Brother John Johnston, Superior General, accepted UNESCO's Noma Literacy Prize in Geneva, Switzerland. The document that had been prepared to support the nomination amazed organizers and journalists by its scope, breadth, and hidden nature, what Lasallian education entailed at that time. The brothers' response to their inquiries was that this was just part of our normal work and reflects the nature of our commitment to education. It highlights the fact that many, if not most, of our innovative educational work is little known or celebrated publicly, which I think is probably fine with many of us. We are not like strident trumpets, but more like muted French horns when it comes to the work that we do. But here are some examples of recent innovative educational programs around the world. The acronyms that you see here in most cases represents the French regional names of those highlighted areas of the world. Uh, but that, those are the code that we use for those particular regions. First, in, uh, in Raylan, in the US and Canada, there are non traditional educational centers such as the Catalyst uh, Charter Schools in Chicago and Tides Family Services in Rhode Island. And places, oh, there are also places for transitional housing, retreat centers, programs for young people with many different kinds of challenges. A significantly relevant recent development was the growth of the Miguel and Cristo Rey schools. In 1993, the Christian brothers opened the first San Miguel school in Providence, Rhode Island. Its replication led to the formation of the Lasallian Association of Miguel Schools. This middle school model for young students from low-income families includes an extended day, averaging nine and a half hours, and an extended year of up to 11 months. The average total enrollment at a member school is 70 students, with an average class size of 19 or 20 students. Currently, there are 11 Miguel schools in the US. Cristo Rey Jesuit High School in Chicago was founded in 1960, 1996 
to prepare youth from low-income families for post-secondary educational opportunities. Five years later, 2001, De La Salle North Catholic in Portland became the second school to take on that model. Krista Ray schools integrate four years of college preparatory academics with continuous professional work experience that, plays most, that pays most of the cost of a student's education. Students job share an entry-level position at businesses around the community one day a week and go to the school for the rest of the week. The school uniform is business dress. There are currently five Crystal Ray assigned schools in the United States. Uh, now in, in Europe, the European area, uh, generally European area, uh, Relem. <clears throat> in Spain, innovation is found in Lasalle Ministries with, with street children, a publications house, and a sophisticated formation framework for high school and college teachers. And in France, uh, France, the community there reaches out through career training and special education programs. Well, particularly noteworthy, I didn't have time to include it in the presentation, was a multi-year program where children in gypsy communities were educated by way of a set of vans that followed the groups of gypsies wherever they went and allowed the, those kids to continue their education in a rather innovative way. And the brothers in Poland are well known for working with developmentally challenged adults and young people, and they, I think they still do today. In Relaf, in the African continent, mostly, uh, they've established rural development centers, vocational training centers, and they serve children traumatized by wars and those traumatized on the street, street children. They're also centers for a professional formation of religious. And there are teacher training colleges in Kenya and in Egypt. In Relal, in Central and Latin America, we're engaged in teaching formation, missionary volunteers, street children, vocation schools, baking, electricity, car repair, and catechist formation. In the North Mexico highlands, there is an extent, extensive religious education program with buses that travel to outlying areas and mountain villages. And in India and Sri Lanka, besides schools, there are, in just the park area, uh, are uh, catechetical centers for youth and for adults, nutrition programs and vocational education, lots of vocational education everywhere. In park, sometimes when we do something for a while, uh, we do it for a while and then we return later. In Australia, this past year, we returned to Balgo Hills, an Aboriginal community in the heart of the desert. We were there from, 18, from 1984 to 2016 and we were in recently invited back. The story behind that is much longer, but uh, somebody from Australia will have to tell that to you. Here are some specific examples we can look at today. Online, uh, I provide online links in the printed version that I'll give you a link to at the end of the presentation, and you can check them out yourself. But the, this is just, these are just some of them. Huh? Uh, in the Philippines, Baha'i Pagasa is an outreach of the Lasalle universities working with court adjudicated youth in a rural setter, setting near, near Bacolod. And another one is located right next to the campus of the University of Manila. LaSalle Green Hills High School in Manila, uh, it's, a, it's more than high school, it's also grammar school, I think, uh, also has an adult, night, an, a, an adult night high school. It was established in the mid 1970s and provides free quality Lasallian education to the marginalized. Started very small, but it's very big now. Offering academic scholarships and assisting the physically disabled through a deaf learners program. Various vocational courses like the ones on the screen provide skills that enable them to earn a source of livelihood for themselves. They, as I said, they started very small, they got very large, and they also offer a five-year, I think it's a five-year program so that these, ki these kids and young people can get a, a high school diploma by going to this program for five years. Most students are from 19 to 65 years old. Classes are held at the high school building from 5 to 9 p.m. after the regular student classes. So the regular school students are there all day at 5 o'clock. 
this, this new community of about a thousand students uh, are become involved in this night school program. It's an amazing program. Since 1961, Your Town provides services for young people that help them access and find jobs, learn skills, become great parents, and live safer, happier lives. Uh, the group tackles issues impacting young people in Australia, such as mental health and unemployment. They also take on issues like family and domestic violence. So it's a great program. One of their more impressive ventures is Kids Helpline, which provides young people with free, private, confidential phone or web chat counseling at any time about anything for any reason. They receive an average of 6,000 calls a week. Check out their website if you want to see an impressive set of services. In Vietnam, um, there are the, the brothers work with street kids and substance recovery. Statistics say that Ho Chi Minh City has over 17,000 addicts, and among them, youth under 18 make up more than 10%. During the past 11 years, the, the Lasallian Christian Brothers of Vietnam have operated the Duc Minh Vocation Center, where, which has things like uh, motorcycle repair shops, uh, and have been very successful in providing gratuitous learning and job skills to over 700 poor wandering street children and handicapped youth. It was, it was the need, they, and they addressed it. Uh, there are pictures on the bottom there of Brother Victor Gill from Spain, who created a bamboo school in Thailand near the Myanmar border. And is, this has now expanded to several schools. They educate children from Myanmar who cross the border every day in order to attend classes there. And they also get, a, a, uh, I think, one small meal there. Uh, great, it's great work. And then the top right, in Pakistan, the brothers run a catechist's training center for Catholic young men who want to become catechists. It is located in one of the very few towns in Pakistan that is largely Catholic, a place called Kushpur. They live with their families in very sparse habitats nearby, and their wives participate in cooking classes and similar practical skills. And, and, and in India, uh, we, there, is a, there are several places that care for orphans. There are two independent communities, Boys Village and Boys Town. At each location, brothers and volunteers provide classes in both practical and literacy skills to students from a wide variety of religious backgrounds. It's really nice. One of the Scott Gibbs uh, videos shows the work there, and it shows each of the religious groups holding its own prayer sessions in their own religious ways. It's, it's pretty impressive. Check it out. Uh, we don't have, to have time to highlight the work of Brother James Kempton in his Reaching the Unreached Community in India one that matches HIV orphans with poor widows in a tight supportive community and family-like housing. And where again, it is the practical and personal skills that have an opportunity to grow. And finally, in my own district, there is the, a joint school between the District of North Mexico and the District of San Francisco, New Orleans. Uh, it's called the Lasalle Central, Central Lasalle. Since 1982, this vocational and educational training center has taught more than 150 courses to young people and adults alike. All the teachers volunteer their time and classes go from early morning through sessions lasting into the evening. As a final example, I picked Utopia, the Utopia campus. In, uh, uh, Utopia is an inspiring and amazing extension of La Salle University in Bogota, Colombia. It is located on the edge of the Amazon, way away from Bogota, and generates educational and career opportunities for rural young people with little economic resources who have been affected by violence, social exclusion, and the lack of education. With the wholehearted involvement of the university, uh, professors come and visit there to, and give classes there for weeks or months at a time. They help with the programmatic organization, the financial help, uh, all the things that you that you might have in a large university are available to this indigenous group. The students become professional in, in agricultural engineering and leaders capable of achieving practical, social, and political transformation for themselves and for their indigenous communities. 
It's a great example of Lasallian driven, Lasallian shaped educational innovation. I've included a link in the notes of, the, uh, of an English language video of the project, so you'll see that. So what can we conclude about innovation in the Lasallian world, both in the past and in the present? Five things. I think there are five things. And part of these came from, from that bulletin that I quoted earlier, but it's, I found it to be very true in, in, in looking up all of these different uh, innovative uh, things that we're involved with. First, innovation initiative takes take place both within and outside of the traditional educative, educational framework. Now, all the schools, I haven't even touched all the schools and what they do in providing innovative teaching, teacher training, formation, need, addressing the needs of students. It's amazing. I just went to the ones that were beyond the, 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 the foundational work of the Institute. Uh, but it happens both, in both places, both within and without. The spirit of creative fidelity and openness, secondly, to new educational needs was present in De La Salle's time as much as it is in our own time. I hope this has shown you. That's why the continuity is, is given to you. Uh, it's, it's as active today as it was when De La Salle first got together with those, with those brothers in Adrian and Yale. And interestingly enough, there seem to be two approaches, two seeds of innovation in the creation of new educational initiatives. Some, organ some organization, well, either, first, sorry, first one is some organization or structure within the institute, like a general chapter, a district chapter, an ad hoc committee, sets up the program, the framework, and the financing based on a request, based on a perceived and studied need, or based on a formal institute initiative. But it comes from that organization or structure that takes, the, that takes the initiative and sets it up and does it well. The second one, the way these things happen, is that a, pers a person or persons together allow themselves to be moved, just as De, as De La Salle and his consulting group were moved when Adrian Yell asked for their help, asked for his help first, and then he got the others involved. People then, as now, respond to a perceived educational need, discuss it with others, and conclude that something could be done together. Results, structure, and financing are not certain. I'll say that again. Results, structure, and financing are not certain. But the relationships between the partners are more important than the establishment of structures and carries the project forward. This reflects an institute-wide preference for people over structures. And if you want examples of this, um, to, uh, talk to people who know how the Catalyst Schools in Chicago started, or how Demerilac Academy in San Francisco started. It's, it's exactly this model happening. And it's amazing what happens, how, how I, I can only describe it as God and Providence coming into the mix and allowing these things to grow. That's the three. Four, we tend to do better with structures that we create or adapt ourselves rather than those that others have created. Sometimes when we go into a particular kind of structure, which it seems to be weird, kind of tough for us to deal with, uh, we, 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 we uh, spur against it. We're, we have, we're not able to do the kinds of things that we want to do in the way that we want to do it because of those limitations. This may be one of the reasons why in some dioceses there are, there's a conflict between diocesan folks and the ones in the school uh, many times because we have so much to draw and we want to do it in a certain way. But we tend to do better with the, the structures that we create or adapt ourselves. And then fifth, we address the needs of real people in the here and now, but with a vision for where individuals will be in five or 10 years from now. This requires careful listening and attention, patience, and mental or cultural mobility, sometimes physical mobility. But it, think about the mental and cultural mobility that's required sometimes, huh? all of which can and should be disorienting because that's how change happens, but it happens to the people involved. What then can we say that innovation is based on our experience. Here's a good definition. Innovation is an initiative which produces something new in terms of relations, procedures, understanding, and in the last resort of structures. 
it is not simply an adaptation to a new situation, but a different way of seeing reality, of relating to it, of allowing oneself to be transformed by this new relationship. In a word, innovation alters people as much as it alters their way of creating society. So, conclusion, huh? The best conclusion that can be made from our 340 years of experience in the area of innovation is this, and the Bolton puts it well. Innovation is necessary for our institute and for the lay people associated with it. I've just called it the institute now. It is at the same time the source of the foundation of persons and of the refoundation of the social body that we form. And then this last sentence it is innovation which nourishes and diversifies our fidelity, says Brother Nicholas Capel. Well written. <laughs> Simply by looking at our history, even by way of a cursory, cursory look, such as we have just done, there's plenty of evidence for that last sentence among our branches and trees. And I'm sure that the forests will continue to grow and prosper into the future in ways that we don't know yet. Uh, so that's, that's the end of the presentation. Thanks for enduring through it, even with the little problems we had. I'm putting into the chat box right now the, uh, uh, the, the link to uh, the PDF of, um, of the, it's a, a page that has all my presentations on it, but on top, on top of it is a link to a, a PDF, it's 40 pages, that shows you the text, the slides, and, a, um, and an overview of Utopia, because I think it's such a nice, ex, uh, such a great example of, of how all this happens that I decided to put it in there. So please feel free to take a look at that and to see uh, to see uh, to see how things go with it, I see I've got about five minutes left. Um, there aren't any questions that I can see yet, but uh, I can see lots of things in the chat. So okay, yeah, so that's good. Um, well, folks, um, I guess my my closing statement is that uh, I've simply been inspired by looking at all of these examples that happened not only at the beginning, but all the way through the history of the Institute and, and seeing how the brothers addressed educational needs when they occurred, as they occurred, and as they were asked. I think when we're invited to do something, we give it very serious consideration, especially if we can do it and if, we, and if it fits in with our with our priorities, which are those in need, the poor, young people, education, whatever brings that together, uh, really does a, a does is, is perfect for us. So I don't know what the future is going to be, but I know it's it's going to expand because the needs are certainly there. We have a great number of people who are interested in being part of this, um, and as long as we keep that sense of innovation and the fact that. That, uh, that it nourishes and diversifies our fidelity and keep that in mind, we won't go wrong. Thanks for paying attention. Uh, I will turn it over to Adam for the closing statement. Thanks, Adam. Thanks so much, Brother George. It was a pleasure to hear your presentation. Uh, we actually have a question here from Craig Franz, and I'm just going to read it here to you um, and, uh, and go ahead and, and answer live. COVID-19 has been a cultural accelerator around the world, greatly affecting how education is conceived, developed, and delivered. After the pandemic, societies around the world will equally relate to a new normal. What unique niches uncovered during this culturally disruptive period might align with the Salian strengths, enabling us to expand our mission in new ways, areas, or approaches? Yes, I would, I would take that, Adam. Uh, who, who, who gave you that question? Uh, that's Craig Fant. You, and you have time. Go ahead. Craig, yes. Hard, hard. Okay. Um, Craig, uh, it's it's a great question, and it is a standing question, I think, because um, for 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 another project, I was asked if I can find people who could who could provide some input as to what kinds of things uh, we've learned about the COVID pandemic. And one response I gave gave is, "It's too early. We, we, we're not even through it yet." But we don't know. I mean, there are some things. There are things that people had to decide, which is part of the the real uh, challenge that's happening in so many of our institutions. Is they have to keep they have to keep the bus going while they're changing the tires. You know, they it's it's a it's it's a really 
outrageous kind of challenge to ask people to do, but they've come up to par. They've, I've heard great stories of, of, of success in, in addressing, uh, addressing the needs in, in innovative ways. Uh, but I completely agree with you that, that after this, there will be some new niches and there will be some new needs that we're not even aware of. I mean, one that I think of now that I'm becoming more and more aware of is the fact that uh, what the experience of young people is. How are they, how are, what's going on in, in their souls, as it were, what's going on inside of them that, that is, is being permanently planted, that will need to be considered as we move forward after this lost year um, in, in whatever educational things uh, we're doing. Uh, whether I don't think it may, means necessary. I think it means we have a, a certain respect also for technology, and, and we also know its limitations, uh, because everybody has said there's something. Th th it's really a limited way of being in. I mean, it's a limited for me not to be in a big room and, and to talk to a little camera in front of me on my desk. Uh, it's it's not the same kind of thing, and it's that experience for us who are older. That experience not might not be so negative. But, uh, but for those who are kids, especially little kids, it's got to have some kind of a, a profound effect. And, and I know that we will, we as a group, will look at that. And that'll be the next question for us as well. What's now needed that we could really make a contribution to? So thanks for the question. Thanks a lot, Brother George. Excellent. OK, well, we'll end there. I just want to point out that uh, there was um, actually a link posted in the chat by Marianne. Um, that looks quite interesting in terms of resource for the and the pulp. Oh yes, that's that's a great story, uh, Marianne. Thank you for pointing that out. I, uh, I did I hadn't included on this, but I think that's a terrific story that that uh, you've also talked about in public before. But uh, and I saw the article that's in the De La Salle today, which is somewhere near here. Yeah, so look on De La Salle today for uh, for that article. It's a, it's a it's it's exactly this kind of thing. Thanks for pointing that out. Yeah, that's good. Uh, by the way, if anybody is wondering, because uh, sometimes people look at people and say, "What is that thing on his forehead?" Uh, <laughs> uh, if, you if if anybody has been wondering, all I can say is I I now know what basal cells refer to. That should be enough. <laughs> but thanks, thanks really for being here for for listening to it. I hope you learned something. Thanks again. Okay, well, thank you for being with us tonight as we begin the virtual Huther 2020 conference. We're grateful for each of you being with us.